Good morning, church. How are you this morning? Uh, today, Romans chapter 9 and verses 6 through 29, long passage, and probably one of the most uh, difficult passages in the New Testament. This passage talks about God's sovereignty. And when we talk about God's sovereignty, what I want you to notice in this passage really is just focus on how God works all things. And, and what I want you to think about uh, first, context, right, from the book of Romans, uh, Romans chapter 1 and 2, we find out that we're all sinners, that we've all turned away from God, that we all deserve God's wrath. And it's so important for us to understand, first of all, we, we deserve God's wrath. Get to chapter 3, we find that God, knowing that we deserved his wrath, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, absolutely by grace alone. So we don't work at all for God's grace. We, we just receive it. Like God God gave us grace, and it's so amazing uh, grace, right? Amazing grace. Chapters 4 and 5, we learn about um, that we're saved by grace alone through faith alone, right? Uh, grace alone through faith alone, Christ alone. That there's nothing we can do to earn God's grace. By the time we get to chapter 7, we've learned about this battle we have. Chapter 8, we learn that God is working all things because we're adopted into his family. And as people adopted into God's family, remember adoption, it all depends on God adopting God's children. And then that brings us to chapter 9. Right? Chapter 9, what we see is that God is absolutely sovereign over all things, especially sovereign over uh, his people and what he's created them to do and, 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 and for doing. And so, um, listen, if, if you take this, it'll strike at your pride uh, just, well, hopefully a lot of it, not just a little bit. Listen, listen to what God's word says and think God is sovereign over all things as we read through this. But, uh, verse 6, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all the children of Abraham, because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise that are counted as offspring. For this is what was promised about this time next year, I will return and Sarah will have a son. And not only so, but also, when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that, listen, God's sovereignty, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not by works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means, because he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will, right? Remember, it's not by works or exertion. This is verse 16. But on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does God still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use, another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles, as indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. And the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of sons of Israel, through the number, though the number of sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay, as Isaiah predicted. If the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, he would have been like Sodom. We would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Uh, amen and amen. May the Lord add to the blessing of the reading of his word. 
big passage and a lot of really difficult stuff in there. One thing I want you to notice, God is working these things. Abraham through his son, right? The chosen one. Um, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. Jacob chosen also. All of this ultimately lead to Christ who would be salvation for the nations, for us, so that the Gentiles would be included, not just Israel. Other thing I want you to notice in the text is it is not by human exertion that we're saved, right? Like Paul writing to the Romans, he looks at the Jews, the Gentiles. He's like, guys, come on. You didn't do anything to make yourself pretty enough, better enough, good enough, holy enough to earn God's salvation. God's salvation is all dependent on God only and God's mercy and God's compassion. Here's, here's what happens undoubtedly, right? We look at a passage like this and we're like, God, how are you fair? And I like the way Paul says this. He says, who are you to answer back to God? Who is the pot that is being molded, right? That's us. We are, we are jars of clay. We're molded by God. Who is the, the molded pot to say back to God, God, you're not fair because you didn't do it my way. Um, here's what I want you to think about so much in this passage. Meditate on it. Think about it. Ask questions. Um, specifically, if you want my uh, input, tag me in it, and I will respond to you. But, but here's what I want you to think about today as you read through the passage. Do you ever act like the pot saying to the potter, why did you do this to me? Uh, and, and if you do, maybe here's the second question. I think we all do it sometimes. What can I change in my life to make me more accepting of what, what God is doing through me? Um, second Second big kind of question, just to think about, how do you see God's sovereignty in your life? How do you see that God is working all things out and absolutely controlling all things so that God would be glorified by his compassion and mercy that he's shown on us?